Welcome everybody to the Men's Yoga Podcast. And today on the podcast, we have a very special guest. We have Bhakti Marga Swami. And Bhakti Marga Swami is the walking monk. And he has a new book coming. All right, it's already out. And it's The Saffron Path. I suggest everyone to check it out. And he's on to share a little bit of insight with us about who he is and share with us about his book. So thank you, uh, Maharaj, for joining us uh, today to talk about your book. Thanks, Matt, for having me. And uh, yeah, it's a great pleasure to have a compilation of uh, the adventures of walking across Canada four times, the U.S. once, and a few other countries that are downscaled in terms of size, you know, like Ireland, right. where very wet, Israel, which is very dry, and a few others, you know, but that was good. That's great. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited. To, I'm excited yeah. to get into this with you. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, before we start, before we dive into the book, do you want to uh, just, I guess, give everybody a little bit of background of who you are and where you're from? Sure, sure. Well, I'm, uh, I'm from southern Ontario. Um, I was born in Chatham, um, along the Thames River, in a hospital. <laughs> it's no <laughs> longer there. And uh, then I, I grew up along the Thames uh, in a farming community. And then uh, our family moved. I've got, you know, a mom and a dad who came to settled in uh, Canada after the war from the Netherlands. And uh, then we moved to another community, not so far away, also very much a sort of a, a agricultural district. And so I was raised on a farm, a family farm, and uh, went through school, um, whatever was taught under the auspices of Edgerton Ryerson. <laughs> mm. Started off in a school in one of those red brick schoolhouses with 30 kids, eight grades and one teacher. Can you imagine? Like, she was like a miracle worker. <laughs> yeah, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was a simple life. And then, you know, I just got into, um, I was pretty serious about my spirituality. I was raised as a Catholic and then, I got, uh, the 60s came into the world. Uh, I was part of the mild member of the counterculture. And uh, at that time, I took some interest in Eastern thought. And I was trying to connect the Eastern and the Western, you know, philosophies of life and, mm -hmm. and see that there's incredible parallels there. And uh, I couldn't understand why there was so many, you know, let's say, walls between di the different institutions. Um, I think that's emphasized too much. Uh, we should try to see how we all can come together. And uh, so I met some monks uh, of the Krishna tradition, uh, which has roots from India, of course. And uh, I started to read the literature and I started to do mantra meditation. And uh, I changed my certain habits and got away from the meat and got into a, like a plant-based diet, and I've been on that ever since. And, uh, you know, at some point in time, I, um, I was living in an ashram in Toronto, and I thought I needed a little change just because I was doing a lot of administrative work. So that I'm going to go for a long walk, and that's what I did. So in 96, I embarked on the first walk across Canada for myself. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. So when you... So you, so you have already had like a spiritual kind of background, you said, before, I guess, you transitioned into uh, bhakti. Now, right. was that like a fairly quick transition or was that like over time, like quite a bit well, over time? I think it was really, um, I mean, the time it took from my, um, my introduction to higher consciousness, as is taught in the ancient book Bhagavad Gita, to the time that I actually became like a full-fledged member, it was within a year's time. But I must say prior to that, I was really in, I was in a searching mode. And uh, the transition was fairly smooth, I would say. And um, apart from the dietary change, I, I, didn't, there, I just saw a lot of similarities, you know. And I just... Um, was interested in going a little deeper philosophically. And that's what I found from the, the teachings that hail from the, from the East, whether it's kind of like Hindu or Buddhist, uh, you know, avenues. 
and uh, and and that was intriguing for me. You know. So did you grow up like Catholic? Yeah, I was I was raised Catholic, and then so anybody who knows a little bit about Catholicism. By the way, it was not an altar boy. Okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, everything was good. I, it was a good experience. You know, my my experience with the tradition was great. And um, so you have inside uh, the walls of a Catholic church or a cathedral, you have um, feminine deity, you have male and female deities, you know. And that, uh, so when I came to Krishna consciousness, I thought that's, I can relate to that. And then there's also the practice of, you know, meditating on it like a rosary. And so that's quite common in the tradition of, uh, of India. And um, I think one thing that really boosted me and got me, really pushed me in, in, a, in a positive way is that the fact that the Beatles were dabbling with Krishna consciousness, and especially right. George Harrison, his music was very moving to me, you know, uh, in, in his albums that he came out with, you know, All Things Must Pass, and just, I think it was The Dark Lord. Uh, I, I, I may be wrong on that one. But songs like My Sweet, My Sweet Lord and Something, which he, you know, the song Something, which mm-hmm. is labeled as a Beatles piece, but it was George's uh, music, actually. And uh, he sings it. And uh, he's, he's talking about something in the way she moves attracts me like no other lover. Something in the way she woos me. I don't want to leave me in. So apparently he was talking about Krishna in this. This, this I know through a friend who oh, wow. was very close to, to George. And he didn't want to let on, there's no gay connotations here. It's just, mm-hmm. uh, right. He was talking about Krishna. And then another song, you know, Here, here Comes the Sun. That, that's yeah. another one by George. So George, and, you know, he was the one that, uh, let's say, Dove deeper into the into the culture than the, the other three guys did, but they all had an appreciation. Right. Yeah. So, did, I guess that had quite a bit of influence in you into um, moving towards this. Did did you have like these arrows pointing towards it, or is it something that you kind of stumbled upon? You know, like was it like, oh yeah, this is this is where I need to go, or was it just more of yeah, you know, I, I don't know how to answer that question. I just say. It was all quite mystical. I was definitely searching, and I was really, I was going to keep, you know, on on the prowl until I could find what I wanted, you know. And then uh, when I actually came to, uh, you know, to visit the temple, and first of all, it was in Montreal on Park Avenue, and then the one in Toronto. Uh, it was a group of spiritualists, so kind of like living communally, you can say. And so the switch from uh, being with a group of, you know, a community of artists to a group of spiritualists wasn't a big change because many of the sort of the people in the monastic setting were all quite uh, creative and artistic, you know. Right. So it was an easy transition. But the biggest, you know, uh, like hurdle for me was living in a big city as I, I I mean, again, right. I was a country bumpkin, you know. <laughs> Just, right. you know a big city that's becoming a mega, mega city. And, and, uh, but that's okay. That's where the people are. And a big part of our uh, culture is to try to reach out and, you know, share, you know, what we, what we enjoy. And that's a big part of it. Did, the, did your family, how did, how did your family take it? Oh, yeah, that's a natural question. Well, again, you know, my my parents had an issue with it, of course. And I remember my father, you know, making it very clear, why do you want to leave a, you know, a good tradition for something else, especially something coming from India? Of course, there were misunderstandings about India at that time. India went through its partition year in 47, and it just received its liberation. So you're just talking about 20 years for, it to get it, for that country to get itself back on its feet. There was a lot of poverty. India was not left in a great state. But it is a country that's very, let's say, industrious, ambitious, smart people. And um, so I bring this up because my, my dad was a little critical. Why do you want to follow something that's, that's coming from India? You know, there's just a bunch of snake charmers. 
and uh, and people are starving, and they're letting all the cows eat <laughs> eat all the crops. <laughs> so, that, <laughs> so, so that was his uh, perception of right. the yeah. culture. Yeah. yeah. So um, and, and you know, so what happened in that, like uh, in time, my uh, my parents uh, were accepting my new approach to life. And they uh, just saw I was, a, I was a happy person. In fact, I was doing better than uh, my peers of the time, you know, where there was a lot of, you know, drugs or whatever it may be, or divorces, and a lot of discontentedness you know, on di- different levels. And uh, my, my parents were saying, well, I, I seem to be kind of a happy chap. And, uh, and uh, so, <laughs> so be it. Let him do his yeah. thing. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, right on. And, you know, one, one, one thing that I really, you know, what we learned from our guru, his name is Prabhupada, he's the founder of the Hare Krishna movement. He actually said, we expect Jesus as our guru because whatever Jesus has, has had to say is pretty much the same thing that Krishna says in the, in the sacred text called Bhagavad Gita. There's no real contradiction, you know, whatsoever. Right. So when I was able to tell my family that, Hey, I never loved Jesus. You know, he's still part of my life. You know, I just added Krishna. And, you know, a lot of people were so kind of dogmatically, institutionally bound, my parents to some degree included. They just feel, oh, really? You can actually, you know, you can accept, you can be a little eclectic. You can uh, go for a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And you can accept Krishna and Jesus and Buddha. You know, they hear about these different avatars. So, uh, you know, I said, yeah, exactly. You know, it's embracing all, all, um, all that they, they have to offer, especially when they're quite similar in their outlooks philosophically. So, um, anyways, my parents... Yeah, that's what, I found, that's what I found for myself as well, where I grew up Catholic, and then I went through a period where I was rebelling, and I felt like I was being lied to, so I kind of lost the Catholic faith and felt like I was lied to with a lot of that. It was actually yoga that brought me back and then learning about bhakti and then, oh, Jesus is a part of this as well in a way. And it was like all the teachings. were So it actually, it was amazing because it brought my spirituality back that I felt like I've lost. And the Catholic religion was big in my family. Like my grandfather helped build the church in Stony Creek. And so it was a big deal around my family. So for me to lose it and then kind of find it again in a different way that made more sense to me, it, it really kind of came around full circle nicely. Oh, it was really that's nice. A, that's a great story. Yeah. 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 And in fact, you know, um, uh, just to tell a story, when I was walking in the U.S., and, I, and I, my route was to go from Boston to San Francisco, on the old Lincoln Highway, which is the oldest highway in the world. You know? uh, they started its construction in 1913, 14, somewhere in there. Uh-huh. And uh, so I was in Ohio, uh, close to Lake Erie, and um, it was a Sunday morning, and a guy pulled over, an Eastern European accent. He said, excuse me, do you, do you speak English? I said, well, I sure do. And he was offering me a copy of the New Testament. and said, well, actually, I already have a copy. And, uh, you know, it, um, you know, it became, with the questions that he was sort of laying out to me and my answers, it became kind of obvious that he was not accepting that I could be, uh, let's say, that I was following some bona fide tradition. And so, that, in fact, the more I said, the, the worse it got. So at one point, I just got, kind of got disgusted. And I said, you know, sir, I don't think we're getting anywhere here. You know, I hope you, and I know it's about, crass about this when I said it. Was, I said, you know, I hope you enjoy meditating on the wall that you just uh, built between us. <laughs> <I just said. laughs> so because, because he actually got kind of nasty and why should right. people of one spiritual faith group be nasty to another? Why can't you just be kind of like embrace each other and, right. and pair notes? Uh, why does it have to be a uh, so let's say rigid. Like I remember the town where I was raised, uh, where I went to school, and there was an Anglican church and there was a Catholic church. They were kitty corner to each other. They had the same red bricks. They had the same kind of designs. 
And I said, well, why can't they just talk to each other? I had a girlfriend at the time, and she was a member of the Anglican Church. I said, oh, no, no, we don't go to see the Catholics. And I was, you know, like, it, it was absolute no-no. And I just, it was hard for me to understand why that had to be there. So being the 60s for what it was, the doors started to open up, and, and there was many good things that came with that, you know, that uh, sense of uh, welcoming and accommodating. You know, that was, that was one good aspect of these, uh, the, the crazy 60s. <laughs> right. So, like, about Bhakti, I mean, I've been reading, like, the Yoga Sutras, and they talk about, like, how, like, it's like a science, this path. Would Bhakti be, like, classified as, like, a scientific method, or it, would it be more, or is it, like, a religion, or, like, how would you define well, it? Talk, bhakti, you know, literally, Bhakti, which is a Sanskrit word, it means devotion. So, it really, is something that's, you know, activated from the heart. You know, uh, it's a lot about feelings and and sensitivities, and also about taking a humble position and really cultivating a love for the absolute. But, you know, a love for God. You know, like cult, build your a relationship with God or the divine. And so that's what bhakti implies. And yoga is, um, which is the way it's been popularized, uh, kind of like through. You know, let's say businesses, you know, wear tight clothes, stretch your body, learn some breathing techniques, get over your failed relationship with someone, <laughs> <laughs> build up some inner strength again. And uh, so it's it's so much more than that. So you can certainly call it a science because there's lots of, there's a technique to following bhakti. And uh, we're, we're talking a little bit more about what's popular, Hatha Yoga or Ashtanga Yoga, where you have the techniques of sitting postures and breathing exercises. And those are all kind of like mechanical techniques that will help you, you know, move along in life, you know. But really, what is the, I would say, the greatest uh, foundational aspect to one's life is when you cultivate that relationship with the divine. When you know that there's there's a, a presence of God in your heart, kind of watching over you, kind of like the archangel or you know, like guardian angel type uh, type of approach. So I would say that bhakti yoga it's it's a lot of everything. You know, uh, it, it, it's it's scientific. Uh, it is. Um, you know, I, I'd, I'd say there's a lot of Catholicism in it, and Protestantism, and Judaism, and Buddhism, and everything. It's, Pretty much, they're all sort of wrapped in one. But the most important thing is to cultivate your love for the divine. And you do that, the, the best method, and here's where all faith groups really uh, share a common ground. And it is in, like we say, chanting mantras. Uh, Christians will say singing hymns. Someone else will say reciting incantations and so on like that. And, uh, you know, like um, projecting sacred sound. You know, that's, that's like a common denominator amongst all spiritual groups. And mm -hmm. oftentimes it's a repetitive sound that goes on and on, and you change the tone of the pitch or the melody. There might be a part two to the melody. There might be a part three, part four, and it goes on just to put in a little diversity there. And that's what... Uh, that's kind of like what we emphasize, you know, in our in our tradition. And it's every um, every person I met who's within the bhakti tradition and who's practicing. I've never met met more warm, welcoming type of individuals. It's 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 interesting when you meet them. It's like even in the groups when we were doing the curtain and whatnot. It's like there's like a big group hug going on at all times. It's, yeah. There's this energy. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. very nice. It's very well, it's very know, welcoming. I say, Matt, it's kind of like it's something everybody wants. Like everybody wants to party, you know. So uh, meaning get together, drop any defenses, uh, get to meet new people. Uh, you know, it's like hearts connecting. And uh, the only thing is that what was really nice about Bhakti Yoga, it's a very clean approach. You don't have to spend a lot of money. Uh, there's no intoxication involved. And, you know, and of course, we're not, no one's barred from 
but practicing bhakti yoga if you're you've got certain habits this, no, that's not a problem there but i'm just saying from in as of itself the mantra meditation makes you a little bit intoxicated it, it, it makes yeah. you happy <laughs> it does and, yeah and in a very organic way you know and uh that, that's what's so uh, pleasurable about it you know and that's one thing that i like when our guru first came to to north america came to new york first 1965 he was just uh he was just introducing a new way of having a party you know and, and of course there's food around or refreshments and when you get a little tired just sit down you get up and just and you dance it's a it's a different kind of dance you know i remember yeah. going to when i was a teenager we used to go to rondo pavilion i don't know if you were you know rondo provincial park and there was this pavilion and it was kind of a druggy place or it turned into that but bands would come in uh and and play and we would everyone just went there to just try to have a good time you know and uh so when i came to fell upon Krishna consciousness, I thought, oh, here is the real good time, you know? Right. Singing and acceptance from everyone, even if you're a little off-key, it doesn't matter so much. Uh, move your body, and it's all in this kind of a surrendering mode, you know? Kind of let loose. And it wasn't sensuous, that's a thing. It, it wasn't sensuous, so... Uh, if you go around the world and you look at different dance forms and dance styles, um, I'd say for the more, um, let's say, well, I'll call it maybe conservative groups, and uh, whether it's line dance from Israel or, or just your s simple square dances, it's just kind of fun. It's very energetic. You don't have to, there is no uh, sensual innuendos, you know? Right. And, you know, so so it's so liberating that way. And yeah, that's what I found with letting go. You just let go when you're when you're in when we're doing the dances and stuff like that. Yeah, it's it's wonderful. When okay, let's go to the book. So the book, the Saffron Path, it is out now and it is available, and it's uh, trekking the globe with the walking monk. And what were you? Why a book? Why were you wanting to share? What were you want, expecting to share? Or I guess, uh, not, what were you wanting to share with the world with this book? Well, you see, the thing is, um, you know, I took it up as a habit it, as a monk in my life several years ago that I would do some journaling every day at the end of the day or the next morning. I would just jot down a one Hilroy page book, what happened that day. And I thought there were some pretty outstanding highlights that I wanted to share, you know? And so when I came to journaling, while going through these uh, marathon walks, I thought I should, I should just continue and report and let people know. After all, a lot of my colleagues were you know, getting a little older and, and a little bit chubbier, like mid-rib bulge and stuff, that kind of <laughs> dynamics. And, and I thought, well, maybe I can just share that walking is good for you on so many different levels. And, uh, and uh, I, I wanted to do that. My first walk was in celebration of my uh, guru's 100th year had he lived that long and uh and i thought let, let's uh let's make this uh, like a birthday gift you know to him and then it would uh, help me also like when you would live in a temple or an ashram there could be a lot of rich food around so when you're on the road everything is downsized <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> And you get a lot of sunshine, you got a wind in your face. And, and uh, you know, the, the, the weather, really, it does kind of, it takes a beating on the ego and the pride. And that's really what I wanted to go through, you know, because as, as a monk, as a sannyasi, as we say, a swami, that's what you go through. That's the tradition, you know. Uh, live simple. So, uh, like Gandhi said, uh, simple living, high thinking. Uh, you know, that, that that he used that that term that our that our guru then sort of took up and took it to another level. Simple living, high thinking. You know, so you get the best of all worlds. You know, the physical and the spiritual. So the book is about sharing, and uh, I had lots of good stories to tell about meeting animal wild animals and being under attack and, and uh, all kinds of good things. And 
also dealing with the uh, the most incredible creatures of all, which are human beings. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> so was walking something that was always in you? Well, I mean, I, I started walking, uh, like I was raised on uh, Tecumseh uh, Parkway, which is along the Thames River near Chatham. And uh, so every day I'd walk to that red brick, one room schoolhouse for one mile there and back. And it was kind of like my downtime. You know, it's my time to to be close to, to the absolute. And also to keep my mind, uh, I thought a lot about Tecumseh. I didn't really know much about him. I know that I know he was a chief. And I, I knew one thing, even in those days, that, you know, your uh, my European ancestors or a white man, white woman, weren't very nice to the native folks, indigenous people. So I just had a soft spot for him. So I used to think about him a lot because I was walking on his road and just maybe, I guess, maybe two two days worth of walk is uh, where he died, right by the Thames River. Uh, that's in Southern Ontario, of course. And uh, so I just had this, uh, it was my time to think to, again, downtime, time to be pensive and introspective, you know? And so the road was always a big thing for me. Uh, there's always a trail. There's always a road that you should be on. And better that you do it on foot than with a set of wheels, and for many reasons. What is one of those reasons? <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, when, when you're walking, I mean, you're, you're getting the best of, uh, of the experience in terms of working the mechanics of the body. And uh, you definitely have, you know, like an incredible vista to look at every day because the weather always changes. You have the birds, you, you know, who are perched up on the hydro lines. You have the farmers plowing the fields and, and the seagulls are coming in behind, you know, to, uh, to get into the action and plunge into the clay and pull out an earthworm and things like that. And then, uh, you know, the, um, the occasional uh, motorist coming in, you have the chance to, to wave. And, and just, uh, it's the most organic thing to go through. And uh, uh, I, would just, uh, I would just encourage people to do, to do this kind of thing because it, it allows you to process the things that need to be processed in terms of what are you going to do. Like you're stepping into the three phases of time, the past, what happened yesterday, what happened last year, for instance. Or you're stepping into the into the future. What will I be like? Will I have a bar like Mr. Jacques Caron, you know, like Jacques Caron and Sons, who was the, our next door neighbors, said, maybe one day I'll be a farmer. I don't think so. And maybe I'll be a farmer and I have my name up there and it'll be and Sons or Daughters. <laughs> mm. And... Uh, you know, so, but I think the most important thing about walking is that you really, uh, let's say, uh, optimize and maximize on the, uh, on the present. And that's really important. I'll give an example that the first, when I was just finishing my first walk across Canada in 96, and there was this, uh, um, somebody from the CBC came, it was a young woman, and she came with her tape recorder, remember those old things? And uh, she asked me all the right questions. When did you start this walk? Oh, well, I started April the 12th at Victoria, BC. And, and uh, so how many pairs of shoes did you wear? Well, it took me four pairs to get to where I am right now. Mm -hmm. And what, what is it for? And I'm telling you, I'm walking uh, for the spiritual healing of the nation. And it's also a little selfish. I'm doing this for myself for, to build up inner strength. And then she had a whole slew of questions. And at, at the end, she asks, so um, now that you're almost finished the walk, you just have a little strip of Newfoundland left to do, what is the most you know, profound thing that happened on your walk? And when she asked me that, I, was, I kind of went blank, and I thought, well, was it, was it the attack by the wasps, or was it the encounter with the bear? Was it, you know, what was it, dealing with the snowstorms, or, or the uh, torrential rains, or or being beaten down by the heat, you know, what, just what was it? Or dealing with hooligans, uh, like uh, on the road, you know, uh, you know, 
the pointing the finger or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I just really went blank. So I just, okay, okay, I, I think I've got the answer. The most, the best thing that happened on this walk is that you're standing there in front of me. You're asking me this question, and I'm trying to figure out how to answer the question. That's the best thing that ever happened. <laughs> and so she just went, oh, I understand where you're coming from. It's like living for the moment, being very much in the present. And, you know, that is kind of like what it is. I think when you're doing the most natural, organic things, such as walking, what we're made for, um, a lot of questions get answered. A lot of problems get solved. Or at least if there is tension, uh, because of what you went through in the course of the day, now you have a time to, to relieve yourself of it, of that tension. And that's why walking is such a, a, the, the best therapy. And, you know, when I walk, I also do some mantra meditation. In fact, the first time I walked, I do eight hours of walking and eight hours of doing mantra meditation. It was very powerful. Well, it sounds it, like it sounds like meditating. Like how you're describing it, right? And yes. there's a lot of people um, who say, oh, I can't meditate. I don't know how to meditate. I can't just sit there. Would this be yeah. something you suggest to them? Yeah, yeah. I mean, why not? Why not walk and chant mantras at the same time? Like, say, like, we all get our minds become at peace when, say, you're sitting at the edge of the lake and the the water is sort of lapping and there's like, there's a rhythm that is created there, you know, there's, there's rhythm in uh, your breathing and similar, there's rhythm in walking, you know, like, um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, and that we don't explore enough, you know, I, I think that our, the automobile has spoiled us, you know, on, on many mm -hmm. levels. And, uh, you know, apart from the fact that it's contributed a lot to the pollution of the world, and it makes you go faster than, than you're really supposed to go, you know? In fact, yeah. one expert said you shouldn't be moving faster than a donkey, because even if you're, you know, on a, on a cart with a donkey, you know, or even if you're on the back of a donkey, if you go thrown off, you probably won't break a bone. But any other <laughs> method, even a horse will, can kill you, you know? Right. So it's, it's the safest way to move in this world. And, and I was really impressed uh, when I was walking through New Jersey when I, I did the U.S. stretch. And it was a Sunday morning, and I was with two other fellows, and we were walking, we were chanting with our mantra beads, like what George Harrison used to do. He would chant on his mantra beads. So we were doing it on one side of the road, and the other side of the road came a group of Christians, and they were chant, praying on their rosary, and we kind of looked at each other, hey, what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> and so we went over to the side, there were a dozen of them, there were three of us, so, you know, we were outnumbered, so we, we just asked, you know, so what are you doing? Oh, we're praying for people. We're, we do this every week, and, and um you know, I remember the, the woman who was, you know, one of the sort of the leaders there. She said, oh, well, oh, it's all the same God anyways. You know, and I yeah. just like that kind of, kind of conclusion. It's all the same God. And uh, so there uh, so there you go. So it's therapy. Yeah, it, it's mm -hmm. therapy. And, uh, you know, I mean, if we didn't have dogs, many people probably wouldn't walk. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. <laughs> But, um, but just just for for meeting the elements uh, and meeting people, and you know the the visual experiences like the aerial battles, you know, between birds and and what you see, you know, all the different kinds of wildlife. It's just amazing. It's just a, it, it's an, the road is an entertainment center. That's what it is. Right. Um. So you've done four four walks across Canada. That's right. And then you've also done a bunch of countries. And we, I, I'm curious to know what countries. But first, I kind of want to know, before you do these walks, like, do you prep yourself? Is there a preparation or you just go for it? Yeah, well, you know, I did do a little training. And uh, that was where I live in downtown Toronto, uh, very close to Casa Loma. I just started to do experiment. Let me see if I can go to see some of our you know, my friends who live in the suburbs, like, uh, let's see if I can get Markham from the downtown. Let's see if I can get to to, to the edge of uh, Etobicoke or something like that. And so, yeah, 
I could do like 22 kilometers and this and that with not much problem. And so that was the training I did. And uh, I probably should have done a little bit more work on it and did a little more uh, let's research on it. Because I just want to tell you, perhaps the worst of the challenges was walking on the shoulder of the road, uh, which means you're walking on a slant. Mm-hmm. And I call it the terrible tilt. And so if you're doing that for many hours of the day, even if you switch sides, it doesn't matter. It's going to have a little bit of a you know, negative bearing on your skeletal <laughs> structure. Right. Yeah. And so uh, that, that I would regret. I would rather be on a flat surface or be something that's just constantly like, like moving like a good train. I've done a good stretch of the Bruce Trail, and, uh, but uh, I'm not ready for that now. I just got my knees replaced. That's right. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, the countries, um, I've done Ireland, Israel, uh, Guyana, Trinidad, uh, the Mauritius, and the Fiji Islands. And uh, I've got my eyes on uh, a few other places, if my surgeon thinks it's a good idea or not. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Well, let's hope, it, let's hope he does. Let's hope he can get out there. What, what was your most memorable? Well, people ask me that. I, I, I must admit, like, when I was walking, that was in 96, and I came to Welland. And I started, yeah, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> I started from Dallas, and then I got to the uh, where the Niagara River starts. You know? mm-hmm. And so I guess I was work, working the peninsula. I started from well, and, and I got to uh, where the uh, where the Niagara River starts, and I followed all the way through through the falls down the gorge, and I made it to Queenston Heights. So that was like eighty-two kilometers something like that in one day. And, you know, those big days are big wins. For me, I'm a little bit self-competitive. And the biggest day I had was in actually in Quebec City. I was uh, walking along the St. Lawrence River, and I just decided I made this kind of commitment. Uh, uh, Krishna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have my best day today. And I covered 99 kilometers in that one day, which is like a death marathon. Wow, yeah. Wow. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. How many hours is that? Did that take? Oh, uh, that took me 20, 20 hours to do. Wow. So I was, yeah, I was, I was there intermittently, you know, having something to eat and also taking naps and, you know, it was a right. little bit grueling, but I had two guys with me to support me. Unfortunately, they fell asleep on me at the end. <laughs> <laughs> um, but. Um, you know, th- those were some good days. And, oh, I- I'd say maybe one of my de- best days was in uh, Cape Breton in-, in a place called Eskasoni. And it's a- an indigenous town, maybe population, I think it's under a thousand. Everybody was so nice. I, I-, I got into the newspaper because media did do a good coverage of the walk. And we we're on page five, the, which is the obituary page. I don't know how I got in there, but there was a little stamp size, practically stamp size, uh, mm. a photograph of me walking and just had a small caption. But that everybody in Cape Breton seemed to pick up on it. <laughs> this way, kind of well, went wild and they pulled over. And here is a donation. Here, it was raining. Here, take this umbrella. Here, you can have this vortex code. Just the. They're so giving. It was so nice and uh, amazing. And and when I got to the general store, which was the only there was only there was one the one local one white person, if I could use that term, so not inappropriate, uh, uh, an el- elderly lady running the general store, I said, "Oh, you're the monk that's walking across town." <gasps> oh, that's so wonderful. Well, you can take anything off the shelf you like, anything. Of course, they didn't have. You know, there were a lot of fish hooks, and, you know, like, <laughs> you know, that's not, not into that one, right? But I was so, so dumbfounded by her, the generosity, you know, of the people. And I'd say was that, there, yeah. Uh, was there any, like, negative interactions that you've had across your walks? Yeah, there were, there were some redneck dynamics. There were. Mm-hmm. And usually that comes from... Uh, I, I just see it as it comes from insecurity. It's usually men. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
and, and yet the, the most curious were also men. And um, yeah, and you know, sometimes the, things get thrown at you. And I remember one instance, I was near Brantford, and that was in my first walk. And some guys had just come out of, I think, high school, and they were just putting up a big uh, you know, drama. I guess they just didn't take me seriously with my robes and everything. And they were um, they, they were just doing, uh, just making fun. And they're making fun right. and, on different levels. They said, excuse me, guys, but I'm just a little tired. I, you know, because they were blocking me, so I just have to keep going. Uh, I'm just uh, doing my walk across Canada. And so when they heard that, they just kind of, they just went into a different mode. Said, mm. oh, well, this guy's serious. He's like, he's very determined. And I, I'd love to have some of that. that. That's the other thing. A lot of uh, a lot of young guys get really impressed with, uh, you know, if you're, you show some element of being made of steel or something like that. They like that. So, um, and there's a history about going across Canada, really, with within Canada, which I've read oh, yeah. in your book, where you started the same day Terry Fox did. It was a 12 years later or yeah. something like that. Because, like, I mean, that's a big thing that we grew up with in Canada right. was that the Terry Fox run, right? And it was a big yes. deal. So, yeah, T- Terry and I was I was in touch with his brother also and of course this after terry passed away and i just we were on on the same documentary together the national film board did the documentary about called the longest road and uh, i was supposed to be the thread i reenacted the walk with the the film crew who started Mm -hmm. bc went all the way to newfoundland and uh yeah so uh, uh, you know there was one spot where where terry fox's uh statue there there uh, the a memorial uh, near Thunder Bay, and yeah, yeah, you naturally you thought you think about these people did incredible marathons, uh, you know, along the way, and uh, you know, unfortunately Terry didn't make it; he went halfway, you can say. Mm-hmm. But but you know, and here's one thing: if you're a walker, you see special thing. There's a little plaque on the side of the road that said, "This is the actual spot where Terry stopped." Oh wow. <laughs> And you know, you know, regular motorists won't see that. This is where he, ended. Right. he stopped. He was driven to the hospital, and then he kind of walked his way, and, and he said he couldn't do it anymore. It's too much pain. Yeah. So you know, there's people that inspire you. I've done these incredible feats, and that's why you do it, right? And you. It's not that you want all the attention, but you want maybe to give attention to the cause, and the cause is, you know. Let's say walk more. Uh, when you walk, you rock. Um, uh, more walking, less squawking. <laughs> <laughs> Again, all those kind of themes is what uh, I was trying to, you know, project to to, to the people I met and, and also to the media. Your poetic side is coming out of you right now. <laughs> well, maybe a little bit. Was there any interactions that you've had, like any scary interactions? Well, you know, I mean, you know, even though coyotes are a very common feature, pretty much globally, you know, especially in the U.S. and Canada, you know, you, your hairs do end up standing on end when you hear them in the morning. There's like a colony, and then just a few meters away, you can hardly see them because it's still too dark. And then they're calling, and then another colony on the other side. Then they respond. <laughs> so that's that. And uh, you know, I did have an encounter with a grizzly bear. And uh, if it wasn't for a tractor trailer like a trucker coming at the right time, I probably would have been toast. Yeah, and wow. uh, and also you know so aggressive even a black bear a mama bear with her cubs nearby she was up like the center of force. <sighs> wow! You no, know, so I got out of the way. That's all I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, um, so, uh, oh, sorry. Were you gonna Were you gonna add to that? Well, I was just gonna say it's a. Uh, you know, there's a lot of aggressors out there, uh, black flies, mosquitoes. <laughs> and you have to learn detachment. I think the lesson to be learned is go through this. 
You know, life is not a bowl of cherries. Life is much more about the good times and the bad times and seeing them to be one. So if you are under attack by a bunch of bugs and they're not easy to get rid of, or it's just the weather conditions are such that, you know, the wind is just it's a bit hard or the rain is just plummeting down, uh, you just have to learn to kind of go through it and uh, learn detachment, which in Sanskrit we call it vairagya. Now, I want to let you know just one of the details is that anytime I did a walk, I always had a person that would be my support. And he, uh, he would check on me once in a while to see if I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> he dropped me off at the place from where I left off the day before and then go back to the tent that we were sleeping in and just wait to let it dry, pack it up, and come see me, see me three or four hours later. And uh, so I had companionship, and uh, oftentimes my support guy would also walk with me for a little bit. And uh, so I had that company, so I, I think I was just getting the best of everything, you know, and uh, when, I'm kind of a patriotic monk. I love Canada, and I like the history of it. And I, I was craving for more, so you read the plaques along the way. So, oh, this is what people went through, uh, uh, whether it's the Winnipeg strike or whether it was the, you know, like uh, when the, there was a big uh, avalanche in B.C. I, I forget the name of the town right now. Uh, many people were killed. And, and then you read in the caption, there was one baby that ended up in the crib safe and yet there was all this devastation around you know all these, these incredible stories and, and also in the states you cross the paths of where the mormons they were pretty much pushed out of the east and then the great trail of the trail of tears when you cross these areas and uh gray owl i don't know if you know gray owl he was that the first uh, major conservationist from the uk and he really got in with the indigenous people at the Algonquins and he, uh, you know, learned the language and then he became a figure recognized and he even spoke to the royal family and then later on he was exposed and actually being a British guy and he's seen, letting everyone believe that he's the chief with the feathers and everything like that. But on the good side, um, he was actually uh, doing a, a very remarkable thing. But it's especially nice when someone pulls over and says, would you like a ride? I said, well, I'm not taking any rides. I'm going I'm uh, going across the country. I'm going to St. John's, Newfoundland. You know, no way. Yes, I am. <laughs> no, it's not my first time. <laughs> and then, well, what are you doing it for? <laughs> well, how many pairs of shoes have you worn? <laughs> and you know, just get into conversation. And then sometimes they want to, uh, like some people ask, can you pray for me or... Could you, could you do a walk for me, dedicated to me? I'm going through stuff. I think one of the most incredible things, I was in the state of Utah, and it was a hot, blistery day. I mean, super hot, and uh, this guy pulled over in his pickup truck. And, uh, you know, he, he went a few meters forward, and then he walked to where I was. And then we met and said, hey, um, I was just wondering if I could take you to my home. We could talk a little bit. And I said, well, uh, first of all, I was a total stranger. You could be a wacko. You know? mm -hmm. You're right. <laughs> and uh, I, I, um, I can't really leave the road uh, because my support guy will be missing me. and We don't have cellular, cellular uh, receptivity. So <clears throat> this guy said, well, this is my home. And he was pointing to the, his pickup truck, and he pulled down the tailgate and said, this is my couch. Can we talk? I said, okay, great. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then he just kind of like poured out his heart about, you know, why is it that we have to suffer so much in this world? So we got into, you know, a tearful few minutes, and, uh, you know, I was just happy to be there to uh, share what I could uh, to give him a sense of optimism and um, philosophically, to let him appreciate, hey, listen, whatever you're going through, it's really temporary. And try to appreciate that 
you know, it is, everything is like the fleeting time and time will work on your side. Just cooperate with it and realize another few things. We're not these bodies, we're spirits. Uh, another fellow I met outside of Winnipeg, he was in a red sports car. You know what red sports cars, <laughs> it was cool to pass. <laughs> anyway, he pulled over and he said, I read about you in the Winnipeg Free Press. I think it's great what you're doing. But, you know, can we talk for a minute? And so I sat in the seat with him. And I said, you know, I was going steady with a girl for five years, and she just recently took off with my best friend. So I'm having a tough time right now. So, you know, again, you just kind of let, let him speak and let an individual like that you know, get things off his chest. And then you offer some words of comfort. You know, I, I, I would suggest, well, why don't you just try this mantra? It's mantra means two words. It means to pacify the mind. So maybe this could help you. And apart from the fact that you'll say, well, there are other opportunities out there. <laughs> Half mm -hmm. the population's female. I'm sure there's someone there for you. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So you're just there to encourage. I remember in Sudbury, one fellow at the newspaper said, oh yeah, I heard about what you're doing. Okay, let's go in the conference room. And he asked all the natural questions, you know, why are you walking, blah, blah, blah. And then, okay, so then he, he, he sort of shifted gears a little bit. So he took off his glasses and put his writing pad to the side of his pen. And then he just kind of stroked the side of his hair and he was like this. So when, um, when you hit, just like on the road, the, um, it's like a metaphor, when you uh, hit some real difficult spots, road, roadblocks or road bumps, um, how do you deal with it? So he was just now suddenly, you're, you're kind of like the psychiatrist or your psychologist. You know? Right. So, and, you know, I'm, I was happy to be there for him. And it was not just trying to cut another story off, you know, to put it in the, in the newspaper in time, like rush, rush. So it's nice to be there for people, you know. And uh, that's what the walk is all about. It's a chance to meet people, to do friend raising and not necessarily... Uh, fundraising. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> Coming out of these past two years, that seemed to be a, a lot of challenge for people. Yeah. What would you suggest to them? Like, is there like a, a, a like a part of the Bhagavad Gita that you would maybe suggest, or is there some insight that you would maybe suggest for people? Because there's a lot of people that are dealing with um, navigating through this part and finding yeah. a path, right? Yes. Yes, I guess some people have become introspective and they've gone deeper into their lives, which is a good thing. Some people have taken it the wrong way and they just go through, you know, sink into deeper depression. And um, to those people, I would just say, like, if we're making reference to the Gita, um, there God speaks and he's saying, I am time. Uh, I'm all powerful time. So time meaning time will heal. Time will get you through this. You know? And uh, sometimes we hear the phrases like uh, mother nature, father time. Like it's an aspect of, of the divine again. You know? Just let time take its course and let it help you to heal through whatever challenges are that have come along your way. Um, so that that's one thing. I, 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 during the pandemic, uh, many people have their lives have been improved, and many have gone the other way. And that's usually what happens when there's a basically a kind of a shakeup. I know that from hearing from my parents from the depression and the Second World War. You know, it brought everyone closer together. Uh, in a, you know, in terms of family and community. It also brought people closer to to their church or whatever, and of course, some people just went uh, the opposite direction. They couldn't they couldn't handle they couldn't bear it. So, uh, I uh, I personally enjoyed two years ago when you could walk on the everyone was walking on the sidewalk. Said this is the way it should be. <laughs> no cars. <laughs> right, right. 
or at least one day of the year, or at least one day of the week, you know, no cars. Right. You know, <laughs> that would be so, so nice. So it can be uh, an incredible healing time. Uh, anything that promotes the natural uh, uh, mechanistic uh, practices, such as walking, anything that can promote that will bring about a, a, a better civilization. People will simply be better off. You know, any opportunity to get away from gadgets. So, you know, just to enjoy the carefree, car-free kind of lifestyle, at least for, for a bit. I would really mm -hmm. wait. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on uh, the podcast today and uh, sharing your stories and talking about uh, your book. Where can everyone get the book and where can you uh, be found also? Well, I think the book, the easiest way to acquire is through Amazon. So you just look up the Saffron Path and uh, you, know, you can look for The Walking Monk and it'll be there and they'll deliver to you at your doorstep in two or three days. There is a name more simpler than that. Thanks to, you know, the big river called the Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll have the links as well. I'll put the links yeah. as well so people can follow the links to the book. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I can be found... Um, I mean, what would you like? Would you like a phone number? Or, or just, just your Instagram or something like that. For Instagram, The Walking Monk. You can check me out there. So I'm known as The Walking Monk and also Bhakti Margaswami, which literally translates as The Walking Monk. And, uh, you know, and... Uh, I, I and you were I'm given that name me. prior too, right? Yes, that, well, that name was given to me by Prabhupada, our guru. And uh, Bhakti Marga literally means the path of devotion. So... On my first walk, it was for the first day, and I, hey, I get it now. He knew all <laughs> along. That Amazing. Doing my devotion on the path, on the trail. Amazing. <laughs> well, thank, yeah, thanks again, Maharaj, for coming on, and uh, everyone check out Maharaj's book, The Saffron Path, Trekking the Globe. Uh, the Walking Monk, and thanks again. Thank you so much. Take care and more walking. Less walking.